what should they do with them? Should uh, they shoot them, or should them should they bring them somewhere else? If so, where? This was the age-old recognition that a uh, state without manufacturing industry has a much much lower carrying capacity for its population than a manufactured state has. Now, we have seen with the shock therapy uh, of the 1980s and 90s a similar effect in many third world countries. The Marshall Plan and later the Havana Charter was based on creating the virtuous circles. Productivity increases, it's what creates growth, and they are activity-specific. There are more of them in some activities than in other. Productivity increases produce higher w real wages. Alternatively, in the third world, you just lower export prices as the, at the same rate of productivity increase. The really virtuous circles start when, higher, when you create higher demand, higher savings, higher possibility for taxation, better health education, and labor-saving technology pays off. Then a large scale of production produces highly diversified economy and systemic synergies. High investments and higher profits. If the fruits of technical change do not produce any increase in real wages, you have underdevelopment. So in a sense, development is an exercise in imperfect Schumpeterian dynamic competition. The higher demand and higher savings result in large-scale of production, highly diversified economy and systemic synergies, exactly the type of qualities that have been identified with economic development uh, for the last four or five hundred years. Higher investments and higher profits, all this produces economies of scale and scope, my claim is that premature integration into world trade and shock therapy has created Morgenthau plan conditions in many poor countries from Mongolia via Africa to many South American countries. If I were to draw a drawing of economic development, it would look like this. Economic development consists of sequences of productivity explosions, of periods where there is a very rapid productivity increase in one or very few economic activities. The nations that have managed to grab these productivity explosions have been the ones developing. The first such productivity explosion that's easily documented is the mechanization of cotton spinning during the first industrial revolution. Here, in a short period, in the, in the late 18th century, uh, we saw productivity increase of almost 30% per year in a brief period. Drawing the learning curve in a different way, uh, we can see um, the same type of productivity increase um, here in the example of the learning curve for shoes in the United States. In 1850, it took 15 and a half hours to make a standardized pair of shoes. In 1900, it was down to 1.7. 1923, 1 1.1. 1 .1, and 1936, 0.9. Rich nations specialize where the learning curve are steep. And export goods from steep learning curves whereas poor nations tend to produce where the learning curves are low. The typical maquilas in Mexico are the labor-intensive activities that, where there is no more learning in the United States. Colonialism was, in effect, a technology policy. Colonies were nations where manufacturing and such productivity explosions, such steep learning curves, were not to take place. A typical quote is from an English economist in 1729, and it's not as racist as it sounds, because this is the policy that England also had towards Ireland. That all Negroes shall be prohibited from weaving either linen or woolen, or spinning or combing or wool, or working at any manufacture of iron, further than making it into pig or bar iron. 
that they be also prohibited from manufacturing of hats, stockings, or leather of any kind. Indeed, if they set up manufacturers and the government afterwards shall be under a necessity of stopping their progress, we must not expect that it will be done by the same ease that now it may. So, colonialism was to keep poor countries in providing natural resources and in diminishing return industries. A further argument along this line um, is found when the people in the plantations, that is in the colonies, want to have their own manufacturing industry. Then, says Matthew Deckers, we should tempt them with a free market for their agricultural products all over Europe. <clears throat> this will betake themselves to raise them, to answer the prodigious demand of that extensive free trade, and their heads be quite taken off from manufacturers, the only thing which our interests can clash with theirs. So already in the 18th century, one policy to keep poor countries from manufacturing industry was to give them free trade in agricultural goods. That did not produce wealth in the 18th century, and it does, does not produce wealth now either. <clears throat> Since my first visit to Peru more than 40 years ago, I've been there virtually every year. And I spent some time there in the 70s, and in the 70s, as we can see on this graph, real wages rose by almost 50%. This is a, a, a graph showing the development of wages in Peru, and in red, the development of export. We see that Peruvian wages hit their highest points in terms of real wages in the mid-70s with a very inefficient and heavily protected manufacturing sector. We can see how real, fa real wages fall as the, the nation opens up. Trade seems to be looking very good, very high increase in trade. At the same time, the real wages in the whole country are falling. And we see that this fall continues with an interruption all the way to 1990, after which real wages flatten off. But the real wages have been reduced by more than 50%. Exports go up and skyrocket, as we see. So from the point of view of many economists, Peru is a great success story. From my point of view, it's a great failure because people's real wages have been more than halved. So the problem here is to explain why Peru had the highest wages ever in a period when they did everything wrong, when they protected an inefficient manufacturing sector. How radical are the suggestions I am making. They are not more radical than the situation was in Norway and in Western Europe in general when I grew up. Uh, this means more profit opportunities locally for local businesses. In the short run, it makes it more profitable to operate in the poor countries. In the long run, this will also benefit the rich countries because the markets will be so much bigger. This is what the Americans said to the English in the 1820s. Let us industrialize like you did, because when we have industrialized, we'll buy much more from you than we do now. We won't buy spades from you, but we will buy machinery to produce spades. This is the logic that capitalism can upgrade everyone in a sequence, just, that is, just as was done in Asia under the flying geese paradigm. This means that um, UNCTAD will play the same kind of role like it did in its early days. And it means that the World Economic Order will look like it did in the 1950s and early 60s. In 2008, we celebrate two events when economic policy has turned away from Ricardian economics. The first time was in 1848, 160 years ago, when John Stuart Mill recounted on Ricardo's trade theory on a very important point. 
nations need infant industry protection in order to get into increasing returns activities. He says, if we do not understand the workings of diminishing return, we do not understand underdevelopment. We do not understand poverty. The second celebration, or the second anniversary that we celebrate this year, is exactly 100 years later, by, uh, by pure chance. In 1948, all the members of the United Nations unanimously approved the Havana Charter, which was an economic charter for the world based on the principles of the Marshall Plan that was proving to be so successful in Europe. The Havana Charter puts employment and industrialization as priorities before free trade. And it's clear that when a nation has entered into the virtuous circles of increasing returns and technical change, free trade is an absolute necessity. But before then, it may cause a nation to create a comparative advantage in being poor. The principles behind this, all the time from 1613 and even before, uh, until this very day, are the same. It is increasing versus diminishing returns. It is synergies between a large division of labor. And it is technical change. But technical change, as English economist Hans Singer proved to us more than 50 years ago, have very different effects in increasing returns and in diminishing returns industries. The principles are the same. The gravity is the same. But the context is new. So the challenge is how to apply the principles that have been so successful for so long in today's context. It's not easier than before. It is probably more difficult. But it has proved to be the only way to bring